Hi, everybody. We're here today to talk about the work of Karl Marx, certainly one of the most consequential theorists ever to write on the subject of religion, and we will be focusing mostly on what Marx has to say about religion. He was, of course, not primarily a theorist of religion. He was an economist, a political economist, uh, but his strong views on the subject of religion um, were very influential in subsequent years. So in, in order to understand what he says about religion, we'll have to say a little bit about his economic theories as well. But let's dive in. Here is Karl Marx uh, later in life when he was living in England, as he did after the latter period of his life. He's depicted here not with a copy of his best known and, and greatest work, uh, Capital, uh, but with his critique of Hegel's philosophy of right. Uh, it is in the introduction to this book that Marx uh, delivers uh, his most influential uh, uh, remarks on, on religion, about which we'll speak a bit here, uh, and about which uh, we'll devote, uh, or to which we'll devote another video um, discussing simply that one passage from his introduction um, to this book. Key Contributions. What are we going to take away from our discussion of Karl Marx today? Why? Well, propose the following. Um, Marx's ideas are not simply ideas. We're not dealing here with simply a, a theorist, though he was a theorist. We're dealing with someone whose ideas have moved nations, um, who have, which have had huge political influence uh, in the 20th century and uh, up until today, uh, very much. And of course, it's a matter of some cultural debate at the present moment uh, to what extent Marx's ideas are influencing contemporary debates. Uh, Marx developed an influential criticism of religion. We'll, we'll look at a bit, a bit at this in detail near the end. Religion is, in a phrase, the opium of the people. And here we have a gentleman smoking an opium pipe. Opium is a drug, a narcotic. Religion is the opium of the people. It is the flowers in our chains. Um, it is something that prevents us from rising up in revolt against our exploitation by the capitalist class. Uh, it is, to that extent, a device of the capitalist class meant to hold down the workers. And Marx thinks it does this in a highly effective way. Um, we'll say much more about all of this. According to Pals and other commentators, Marx's system of thought has itself been the basis for a kind of religion. This is something that's actually been much debated. Um, is Marxism itself a kind of religion? It has a kind of salvation. As you, you, you engage in critique, you become aware of the structural injustices of our world. You begin to struggle for justice with the hope of achieving what looks to be a kind of kingdom on earth, right? I should say kingdom of heaven on earth, right? The, the classless society in which there will no longer be exploitation or, as Marx also uses uh, the term influentially, alienation. You, you won't be separated from your true identity, from the products of your labor, from other people in your society. Uh, all of this is, and, and I, I would preface everything I say in this lecture, everything here is much debated and controversial. What I'm trying to do is simply gather together in a, in a short space a basic introduction to Marx's thinking as it pertains to uh, religion. So I, I caveat every statement I make <laughs> in what follows. Uh, lest the comment section be uh, especially active on, on this particular video. Marx's contribution was by far, as noted, mostly in economics and politics. He was not primarily a theorist of religion. Uh, but let's take a look at some of that economic theory. We will, in a moment, um, in order to get at what he says about religion. Here we have an image of the young Karl Marx. Um, he was born in 1818 in Trier in Germany. Um, he lived in early life, much like young men of his time, of uh, dueling and, and brawling and, and doing things that people did. He was not exceptional in that way. Uh, but he really became a serious student when he discovered the work of the philosopher uh, uh, Georg Wilhelm uh, Friedrich 
Hegel, GWF Hegel. You know, all you need to remember is Hegel, right? Hegel's work was monumental. And this was not only for Marx. Marx was one of a group of students uh, and, and others who were influenced by Hegel's work. Uh, they were known as the young Hegelians. Um, they were paralleled by the old Hegelians, which is kind of interesting. And there's much that can be said about this historical period. Uh, Marx, uh, as part of the young Hegelians, or what were called the left Hegelians as well, in the political sense, like the, the left wing politically, um, wanted to use Hegel's thinking in a different way than it seems Hegel himself perhaps had, had intended to understand material life. Hegel was primarily engaged with ideas and with thought, uh, whereas Marx was engaged with class and economics and material realities. And we'll say more about Hegel presently. Um, he and his family, Marx, um, moved around Europe to various places, and in France and Belgium, for example, um, and eventually moved to the United Kingdom, to the UK and uh, England, where he uh, famously um, worked in, uh, in a library in, in London for many hours, uh, writing some of his most influential books. Um, he co-authored a number of works with Friedrich Angles, like the Communist Manifesto, which perhaps you have read, or certainly uh, which you've which you've heard of. This is the work most often assigned in kind of introducing Marxist thought. Um, and his greatest work was Capital, Das Kapital, uh, where he laid out his economic theory in a way that would be very influential in several volumes. Uh, he died uh, in, I say here, relative obscurity. I, I'm not sure. I hope that's entirely fair. Um, he was a person who was working in the library, literally reading books, writing. Um, at the end of his life, um, he was not out marching and, and rousing crowds. Um, he was laying the groundwork for the revolution that he believed would follow thereafter, and, and which in many ways did in a variety of movements in the later 19th and, and of course, throughout the 20th century, most uh, importantly in uh, the Soviet Union um, and in, um, in China under, under the leadership of, of Chairman Mao. Important influences. I've mentioned Hegel already. We have an image of Hegel here on the slide. The second person I'd mention is Ludwig Feuerbach, um, who's also depicted here on, on the right. Um, from Hegel, Marx took a way of understanding thought and the dynamics of history. This is called the dialectic. How does one idea lead to another idea? One way of thinking lead to another way of thinking. Hegel was a logician, a metaphysician, a philosopher, and he wanted to understand these dynamics. And, and he thought, um, I, I, I suggested before perhaps that he was only dealing with ideas, um, he thought that these ideas drove history. He was very interested in the philosophy of history and why things have developed as they did. So it was not a complete departure for Marx um, to apply Hegel's ideas to, to material life. Um, but whereas Hegel was mostly focused on those dynamics of thought, Marx thought that you could apply this not only through ideas. It wouldn't just be that ideas developed in such a way and then these ideas had an effect, but that actual material relationships developed in the way that Hegel thought ideas developed. Um, this view was known as dialectical materialism. Right? Materialism is a belief that there is only matter, and dialectical is an adjective uh, indicating that matter uh, develops uh, in its relationships through this dialectic process. We're going to talk about that more in a, in a minute. Um, this is called, for shorthand, diamat. Uh, by the way, uh, this was uh, the term used in the time of the Soviet Union when Marxist theory was very widespread. From Feuerbach, the second picture uh, figure uh, depicted on the slide here, Marx took the idea, um, and this is one, this is probably Feuerbach's biggest idea, so to speak, that what we call God is actually just a projection of our own best human qualities. So we think of God as a being outside of ourselves. There's us and there's God, right? Uh, what Feuerbach thinks is, well, first of all, there is no being outside of ourselves called God. So he's an atheist. Uh, he thinks, though, 
that we developed that idea of God as a being outside of ourselves by taking our own best qualities, goodness, truth, beauty, justice, um, all of these things, maximizing those qualities, imagining what they would be if they were perfect, right? Not, not imperfect in the way that we instantiate them, but, but really in their fullness, and then projecting them, that's, that's the key verb here, to project, right, as, as like a projector on a screen, into something else that looks like it's outside of ourselves, right, it's much bigger, and it's perfect, because we've designed it in our thinking to be perfect, right? By comparison with this being, this perfectly good, true, just, beautiful being, um, we are always going to be imperfect. We're always going to fall short. We're never going to be as good as God, right? Because we designed God to be the perfect version of ourselves. So what Feuerbach thinks is that this projection of God sets up a kind of being that we can never compare with and makes us always feel like we're falling short, that we'll never achieve real you know, goodness, truth, beauty, justice in the world, right? We're basically selling ourselves short. We've taken all of our own potential and, and goodness and, and, and truth and beauty and justice and, and ascribed it to some other being that, for Herbach says, does not exist. So why do we do that? And how can we stop doing that? Because he thinks if we stop doing that, we'll be in a position to achieve on earth right now um, exactly what we have uh, formerly thought was achievable only either by God or in the future, in some sense, in the kingdom of, of heaven, for example. So both of these thinkers, Hegel with this idea of the, the dialectic, which we'll talk more about, and Feuerbach with this idea of God as a kind of projection of ourselves uh, are very influential on Karl Marx. The dialectic, I don't know why I had it go that way. Anyway, okay, why didn't I just have it appear together? Um, now, I, I, I'm conscious in presenting this. It's going to seem like quite an oversimplification to people who are familiar with Hegel, and so I would you know, beg your indulgence as I, as I simplify Hegel's view on this point. Um, what's the basic idea? The, the three terms are thesis, antithesis, synthesis. An idea is proposed. You know, I, uh, I want to um, go to Boston, right? And an antithesis is proposed. Um, I don't want to go to Boston. And so a synthesis emerges from this. Okay, well, we're not going to go to Boston. We're not going to not go to Boston. Let's go to some third place, right? Let's, let's take the, the idea that we're going somewhere, and allow that, okay, it's not going to be Boston. We're going to combine those two ideas that are opposed to each other. Yes, Boston, no Boston. And we're going to come up with a third thing. Um, now, ideally, I'm not sure my example illustrates this, that third thing would follow logically from the first two. But, you know, maybe we're going to go to Providence instead or, or something like this. Um, what the example uh, uh, perhaps illustrates is that there is a progression from the first idea to the opposing second idea that creates a tension, right, raises a question, what's going to happen, that results in a third idea that combines the strengths of the two. It synthesizes the strengths. It brings them together, right? That new idea is then opposed by a second idea, a, a new second idea, a new antithesis, antithesis right? Um, so this, this thesis, which is the result of the first conflict, is met by its own antithesis, yielding yet another conflict and a new synthesis, right? And so thought proceeds in this way for Hegel. Logic proceeds in this way. Uh, reality is not just a bunch of stuff kind of sitting next to each other, right, in, in various relationships. Reality is a process. It's an unfolding, right, of different things coming into conflict and yielding new things, which in turn enter into conflict and yield further new things. Um, for Hegel, this process goes on and on until you reach, at least in principle for Hegel, absolute knowledge, he calls it. Uh, and this is when you've gone through the whole process. You've, you've worked out every logical possibility, 
hard to imagine when this would actually occur, although some people think it has occurred. <laughs> Interesting debates. Um, once you've worked out all of these logically possible oppositions and you come to a final synthesis, right? You've reached, as Hegel will put it, the end of history. Um, and, and I refer to people who have said this. Some people, for example, thought that throughout history, we've been working with all these different political systems, right? Is it capitalism or communism, is it feudalism, uh, is it a democracy or monarchy, or, you know, all these different systems. And uh, around the time of the end of the Cold War in the early 1990s, um, there was a, a, a foot in intellectual circles, an idea that liberal democracy, liberal democratic capitalism was, in Hegel's specific sense, the end of history. Right? We've worked through all these different failed systems of economy, of politics, and we've come to free market economies and liberal democratic government. Um, that's the end game. Everything wraps up there. We're not going to do better than that. That is, uh, to allow ourselves to phrase, absolute knowledge in Hegel's sense. We're done. Right? History is over. History is the process of this unfolding and this tension. Um, it turns out that that seems not to be the case. Um, there's plenty of opposition to liberal democratic free market capitalism today, uh, for better or for worse, and so history uh, seems to continue. But, but that's the idea for Hegel, is that different ideas enter into conflict, and eventually you come to uh, absolute knowledge of finishing that process. Marx accepts all that, but he does it in a material register. So for him, the thesis and the antithesis are not simply ideas, right? History is not the unfolding of ideas or ideals, as I have here on the slide. History of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggles. The haves and the haves not, have nots, the rich and the poor, the capitalist and the worker, entering into conflict with each other, right? And that conflict yielding a new top class, right? He traces this historically through lots of different historical moments. Um, and at the beginning of this process, he identifies as the kind of culprit, and here he's following Rousseau in an interesting way, private property, right? Private property, he says, yields separation of classes by power and wealth, and with it the beginnings of permanent social unrest. So long as we're all living naked in the forest and don't own anything and get along with each other and make no claims on, you know, anything for ourselves, we live in peace, right? In harmony. And I don't know if that ever actually happened, but in principle, we would. Um, however, we do lay claim to stuff. Like your phone is your phone. Someone can't just come and take your phone. That's your private property. Well, oh, now you have a conflict, right? Because someone stole your phone. Uh, the idea of private property, Marx thinks, initiates this struggle. And the struggle is history itself. History is the history of class struggles. Now for communism, uh, co for Marx, communism is a way to do a couple things. On the one hand, it helps to explain these realities to people who can't see them. If you don't have this kind of synoptic view of history, you don't see the unfolding of these struggles, then you're unable to appreciate where you are in that process. You're unable to identify yourself as, as a worker who is, as we'll see in a moment, is being exploited, right? And should rise up in revolt against the owners of the factory or the means of production or whatever it is and claim what is yours, right? And namely what the property that is being stolen from you. Um, you need to, we need to raise consciousness was the term that's often used. Um, uh, among, among people. And second, um, communism serves to prepare the working class for a revolution. Because once you've engaged in consciousness raising, once people understand what's going on, they will be naturally affronted by this. <laughs> they will say, this is wrong. And when they say this is wrong, you can expect an actual real existing physical revolution, right? And those who have not will take from those who have because they're, uh, they, they have been unjustly exploited by, by those who have um, on this view. And that this revolution is, is what Marx and, and his colleague Engels worked for throughout their career. 
Um, so we referred already above to dialectical materialism, but we can look at it a bit better now with the with the benefit of the spirally picture, right? Um, so the workers and the owners are in constant conflict. Social class is the basis of this. So the workers fight, uh, the, the the workers oppose the owners, right? And uh, they do this because they are alienated from their own labor. They realize that what is properly theirs is being taken from them, right? Uh, and thus they, they rise up and uh, engage in revolution um, to overcome this, this state of affairs where they're, they're alienated. Let's talk a little bit about alienation. So <clears throat> I'm working in a shoe factory. I make shoes. I like my shoes. I identify with my shoes. I feel like, you know, I do a good job with this. Uh, now, I work all day. I work for eight hours. And let's say I make uh, $100 in, in eight hours, right? Um, that's that's not so bad. Um, no, let's change it up. Let's say I make $10 in eight hours, right? Because I'm an exploited factory worker. I, I agreed to that rate of compensation with the, with the capitalist, uh, and, and it seems okay. Now, I realized then that the shoe that I spent my eight hours making, I earned my $10, is being sold by the capitalist, uh, the owner of the factory, for $100. Okay, now, I, I spent all my time making these shoes, um, and uh, not only is the shoe that I made not mine, it, it belongs to the owner, it belongs to the capitalist from the beginning, but the, the owner, the capitalist, is earning from that shoe that he or she sells far more than I was paid for my labor. Marx refers to um, the, the discrepancy, and I'm going to get the term wrong here. Is it surplus? I'm going to get the term wrong, so I'm not going to say it. I don't want to say things that are untrue. There is a discrepancy between the amount of money that the capitalist earns and the amount of money that the worker is paid. That discrepancy is the amount that is stolen from the worker by the capitalist. Right? That's what exploitation means. I mean, to exploit something is not intrinsically a bad thing. I can exploit an opportunity. I can go on an exploit, right? Which is to explore something or try to do something. Um, so uh, the, what, what's unjust is that here you have one human being exploiting another human being, right? It, it's not just that I'm taking advantage of some natural resources in a sustainable way. It's that I'm actually driving my workers into the ground by paying them an unjustly low wage by myself uh, and while myself becoming uh, very wealthy. Um, this is the way in which the worker is alienated from the product of their labor. They can't even afford to buy the shoes that they made and we're so proud of, right? Everything that we've described up to now is part of what Marx refers to as the base of society, right? On our chart here, we have uh, base referring to relations of production and the means of production, right? We've been describing how the bourgeoisie, uh, uh, bourgeois uh, is a French word meaning a person who lives in a city, uh, it's from the German word a burger, or a person who lives in a town, right? So the bourgeoisie are your kind of urbane elites, right? People who often own the factories, who are the, the capitalists. Um, the proletariat uh, refers to the working class. That is the class that is in the process of becoming conscious of itself as the working class and preparing to rise up against the people who hold them down, right? Who are exploiting them and leading them to be alienated from the product of their labor. Um, it also refers the base to the means of production, the machines, the factory, the land, the materials, the stuff that you gotta have to make the shoes. You gotta have the leather, you gotta have the, uh, the machine to make the hole in the shoe, you gotta have the machine to weave the shoelace, you gotta have the hammer to affix the sole. All of these things cost money. Uh, someone has to provide them for you in order for you to do the work, um, or you have to own them yourself. Um, Marx thinks that the capitalists own the means of production, that is the hammer and the tools and the weaving machines, um, whereas and the workers own none of that. They simply work on those machines. Um, this base, Marx thinks, in Pals' phrase, generates the division of labor, the struggle of classes, and human 
alienation. Again, it's everything that we've talked about so far. Above this is the superstructure, as if a kind of attic on the house, as depicted in the image, as something that rests on the base. So the base is real. The base is on the earth, right? The base is what everything is built upon. The superstructure are, uh, as Prowse puts it here, other spheres of activity. The things that are so visible in daily life um, belong to the superstructure. Family, government, the arts, most of philosophy, ethics, religion. Uh, in a word, ideologies, right? Now, we use the word ideology in a casual way to refer to any set of ideas, right? So we might say, well, what's your ideology, right? For Marx, ideology has a really specific meaning, and I would go so far as to say this is just the meaning of the word, right? An ideology is a manipulative system of thought designed to fool people and to and to control them, right? Ideologies are, are propaganda, right? The term ideologie is, is first used in, in France um, in the 18th century during the Enlightenment to describe a system of thought that's not like philosophy, that, that that's, I mean, philosophy means the love of wisdom, right? So you're, you're trying out different ideas, you're exploring different things. An ideology is like a manufactured philosophy, right? It's been designed for a certain purpose. Um, and Marx thinks that purpose is singular and clear. Ideologies control the poor, right? So the rich endow a foundation or they, you know, sponsor a conference or they found a school or something like this, right? They do some kind of thing to promote the arts or culture, right? But what they're really doing is creating a narrative. They're spreading a kind of propaganda, right, that will convince people who work for them, the poor, the exploited, the alienated, the working class, right, that they should not rise up against them, right? The, that the poor should not take the money of the rich, right? Which is, in fact, from Marx's point of view, the poor's own money that's been stolen from them, right? So uh, it says here, for example, um, most of philosophy is ideology. So the stuff that that we're teaching in this class is probably ideology, or these so many so many different ideologies, according to Marx, right? They're they're all different ways of kind of holding you down. Um, the sole exception would be Marx himself, um, <laughs> and some aspects of other thinkers um, who are engaged in what Marx calls criticism or critique right? A critique of Hegel's philosophy of right. Um, critique, Marx thinks, is different from philosophy. Um, whereas philosophy is kind of talking about large cosmic ideas and the meaning of life, critique is when you look at a system of ideas or a reality in the world and you criticize it and you take it apart and you see how it works, right? And you kind of expose its dynamics. Uh, that's what Marx is doing with capitalist economies. In fact, he's, he's trying to critique them. He's trying to break them apart, break them open, see how they work, and then expose those inner workings to the world, right? To stoke revolution that he thinks is morally required. Um, the, the, the takeaway here is that the only real thing is the base. The superstructure is just smoke and mirrors and distractions and pretty shiny things that make us uh, uh, willing to, to not act, right? And make us even enjoy our subjugation. Base and superstructure are related to each other, um, just briefly, uh, continuing this discussion. So again, we have the means and relations of production down in the base. Um, so the base shapes and maintains the superstructure, right? The, the owners uh, fund those organizations and schools that teach people, uh, I don't know, culture, religion, philosophy, law, media, politics, all the things listed there under superstructure, middle ideology, because all of these things are, are ideologies. But then the superstructure informs the base insofar as it prevents people from seeking actually justice, right? And breaking their chains and freeing themselves from exploitation. I think we're coming to the end. I don't remember if this is 
the very last slide or not, here we have some opium uh, on the slide. Um, we'll say just a word about this now, and then as I said, we're going to reserve discussion of Marx's actual passage on religion uh, for a separate video, so as, so as not to tax you unduly with the length of the video. Um, the worst example of an ideology, we're talking about superstructure, right? So all those different things, family, culture, philosophy, religion. The worst example is religion, right? It is pure illusion, Marx says. Religion is used by the owners, by the rich people who own the factories, right? Um, and also supported by the naive cooperation of the intellectuals. Me, right? So I am a person who is spreading, outside of this video, of course, which is an entirely uh, an, an awakened production, um, I am spreading, and people like me, ideas that hold people kind of in their thrall. You know, young people get interested in philosophy, and then they, they, they study it for a while, and then they decide they're going to be a professor, and they become a professor, and then they become kind of a conservative upholder of the status quo, right? Um, not all professors do that these days, happily, um, but some, some perhaps do. Um, the owners and the intellectuals who aid and abet them convince the poor to stay poor. That's the short phrase. Marx, therefore, quoting Prometheus in his doctoral dissertation, uh, rep repeats the, the phrase, Prometheus is a mythical figure who opposed the gods. Um, what Prometheus said is, I hate all the gods. Right? Marx hates all the gods. Marx hates God. Why does Marx hate God, though? And, th and this is an important thing to get straight. It's not that Marx is just a hater. He's just, he's just a dark and hateful person, you know, like all those atheists. Marx thinks that manifest, visible, disgusting injustice is occurring every day, right? And almost like a prophet straight out of the Hebrew scriptures, he's saying, no more, right? He's saying, we must rise up against this injustice. And this idea of God is actually preventing us from doing so. Right? This is, this is uh, making us feel that somehow our station in the world is predestined. Right, God must want it this way. Oh, I heard you have to obey the secular authorities. Didn't St. Paul say that? Marx thinks that this is just so much smoke and mirrors preventing people from seeing what is plainly the truth, which is dialectical materialism, history developing as a process of class struggle. The falsity of religion, he thinks, can be exposed by critique, right? And we have one phrase from the passage I'll discuss in the next video. The basis of irreligious criticism is man makes religion. Religion does not make man. You could substitute there. Man makes God. God does not make man, right? Here he's channeling Feuerbach. The very idea of God as the one who is worshipped and so forth is itself just a distraction. It's just so much noise. It's false, right? And once we realize that God didn't make God, didn't make us, we made God. We made up that idea. All of that whole little religion thing. It's just people saying stuff to control other people. When we wake up to that fact, uh, we will be able finally to find the courage to rise up and refuse the injustice that surrounds us on a daily basis. Analysis and critique from pals. Um, Marx, according to pals, um, and I shouldn't say according to pals, plainly, Marx is, pals points out, engaged in a functionalist explanation of religion and also a kind of reductionism. Uh, functionalism, again, means that Marx is saying that religion is kind of nothing in itself. Religion is performing a function, right? And that function is to keep the poor down. That's what religion is doing. And he's saying that's all religion is doing, right? So if you think that you derive a sense of meaning and purpose and comfort from religion, all that's very nice, right? But at bottom, all of that is just ideology. That's just superstructure, right? What's really happening is you are being hoodwinked, right? And you are being uh, made to be satisfied with your situation in all of its injustice. 
um, we have on the slide. Marx agrees with Tyler and Fraser that beliefs of religion are absurd superstitions, and he also agrees with Freud and Durkheim that we need to explain why people hold them. Quite so. Um, but, Pals points out, Marx goes farther than this. He thinks people cannot be better off until they are without these absurd superstitions of religion. So it's not okay to tolerate religion. It's not okay just to privatize religion and say, hey, you do you, believe what you want. Um, because religion is indeed an absurd superstition, and worse than that, it is a tool of injustice. Religion needs to be rooted out. It needs to be ended, right? And, and this is what we see in the Soviet Union, the history of the Soviet Union, and in uh, much of the history of communist China until recently. Um, religion is not just a kind of private occupation. It is a poison. It is a drug that is, that is preventing social progress from happening. A second point in Pell's analysis is concerns the relation between economics and religion. Uh, he writes, it, it is impossible to understand religious life anywhere without exploring its close ties to economic and social realities. What's this mean? If I say I'm going to study religion, right, it's not enough to say, oh, I'm, I'm just going to read the Bible and talk about what it says, right? Or I'm going to read some spiritual books by, by different authors and just kind of reflect on the deep meaning of what they're saying. If you want to understand religion, you need to look at who wrote the Bible? Not God, but like human beings. Who put pen to paper? Where did they live? Who did they interact with? How rich were they? What was their social, their economic position? What were their interests? Why did they write what they did? How did their community relate to other communities in the region? How was their work received? How has that text been used historically to justify this or that or the other thing, right? What is the kind of effective history of that, of that text. That's what it means to study religion, not to think about whether God is a, you know, unity or a trinity. This is ideology of the worst kind. That's simply distracting people and making them think there's something more important than a class struggle, which is history itself. Um, so uh, talking about the study of religion in this class, I mean, the study of religion becomes, in a way, the study of economic history, uh, of social history, of the actual uh, circumstances and conditions uh, in which religious ideas were formed. Um, and those religious ideas are, to an extent, reduced to that, um, to that uh, base of economic and social conditions. One last slide here on, on critique, and, and, and Marx, as you may have, uh, sorry, Pals, as you may have seen, is not a is not a uh, enthusiastic fan of, of Marx, but but I think he's also um, I, I would I would submit um, level uh, even handed in level headed and even handed in his uh, in his criticisms. Um, he emphasizes three such criticisms. Um, the first concerns Christianity and and religion as a category more broadly. Marx focuses on on Abrahamic religions. I mean, so his view works especially uh, if you're talking about um, you know, a, a single God that is transcendent. Uh, so Christianity, Judaism, Islam all have a notion of God like that. And the question is raised, well, how much does this actually apply to other religions? Um, my own sense is it probably applies fairly well. You could talk about Hinduism or Buddhism or even Taoism, shamanism, uh, and do a kind of Marxist analysis of that. But this is something that, that people have debated. Um, the second concerns religion reduction superstructure. So uh, we have on the slide here, still all religion is part of the superstructure. But Pals asks if this relation between base and superstructure is as straightforward as Marx suggests. Um, we'll see soon in our discussion of Max Weber that uh, there could be a two-way relationship here, right? So not only that the social and economic base influences um, ideas, um, but that also ideas might influence the social and economic base. Um, for Marx, though, it's in one direction. The base creates the ideas, right? The ideas are formed only because of conditions on the ground, as it were, and, and to deny this is to kind of deny what is plainly uh, apparent throughout history in his view. Uh, a final point here concerns uh, political problems, and, and this concerns really goes beyond religion. We're talking about 
Marxism as the basis, of, as a political philosophy that can serve as the basis of a real existing governmental structure. I mean, can we really reach a classless society in history? I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm a little skeptical, but I'm also a little skeptical that Marxists actually expect that's going to happen. Right? I mean, I think it's more like a, a regulative ideal. I mean, you're moving toward a classless society and asymptotically approaching it and you know, maybe never quite reaching it, but coming ever closer. Um, will a small elite be the actual rulers? I mean, certainly in the Soviet Union and perhaps in communist China, this is something we've seen. I mean, the Communist Party is a very highly trained and dedicated elite leadership in, in China, for example, and it was the case also in the Soviet Union. Um, the idea is that you know, all people are, are you know, in power or working together. It's communism. Um, but in practice, it does seem that a, a, well, I, mean, I, I would hazard, I mean, I guess this is my judgment, it would seem that a small elite does tend to kind of uh, control the situation or take over. Um, this might even just be for practical reasons rather than any specific flaws um, or any flaws specific to Marxism. But these are all things for us to consider as we recognize that uh, debates about Marxism are really quite contemporary, really quite current. And I think understanding the, the basic dynamics of Marx's idea, uh, ideas about the dynamics of history, about the relationship between economics and ideas, this is very important today. So I thank you for taking the time to consider uh, Marx's ideas, especially as they relate to his uh, account of religion.